<clears throat> I got to talk loud and fast so that Nana doesn't go to sleep on me at night. She's been up all night. In answer to the question, who let the dogs out? Nobody. They were up barking all night for her with the yeah. thunder. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty 
and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So we're looking at the coronation. It's one of those things where... <clears throat> Come on now. Work with me. I'll oh, don't be that way. I'll turn it on. Then I'll turn it on. See if it works now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Never mind. You just gotta love taking it. Come on. Work with me. It's a coronation. And uh it's at Mizpah. We've been there before in some of our previous studies. And uh, sometimes it's confusing when you read this, what was going on. Uh, from your interpretation of what I just read, what happened when they got to Mizpah? <clears throat> Huh? It's confusing, isn't it? How many of you say, that's a little confusing? Look, just a little confusing. They, he called all the tribes. We, don't, we can't believe that all the tribes were there in person. But representatives from every tribe and every family in the tribe at least was there. Mizpah is not a big place. So you couldn't have a couple million Jews show up at the same. Well, they would have had some stuff, wouldn't they? Would have had some baggage. But uh, the gist is that they all came and tribe by tribe passed by. Some commentators say, well, they were passing by and casting a ballot. But I kind of think that it would have been recorded mm, yeah. if there was a ballot or a lot cast. Uh, it seems more reasonable that what happened previously in Scripture happened here again, where the Lord had people pass by the prophet, and it was reconfirming what God had already told Samuel. You remember last couple of weeks, God already spoke to him, Saul was to be the king, he already anointed him. This was not an election. Okay? But it was, as they passed by, it was a confirmation that God was using the, the prophet and as each tribe passed by, it was reconfirmed in Samuel's heart exactly what God had already told him. The tribe of Benjamin, which was the smallest tribe of all the, the tribes of Israel, unexpected, wouldn't expect the next, the first king to come from that group. And then they passed the tribe through, and the Lord's Spirit was upon the house, the family of Matri, and one of the offspring of that family was Kish. And when he passed by, it was confirmed again to Samuel that Saul, son of Kish, was to be the first king. Uh, we find something similar <clears throat> pardon me, happening back in Joshua. Would somebody read for us uh, Joshua 7, 12 through 15? Oh, quick yeah. shot. I, I didn't know it. I couldn't see it. It looked oh. like that uh, Jamie had grown up an extra ear there for a second. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua 7, 12 through 15. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. 
get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. Because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord sh shall take, which the Lord takes, shall come according to families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come by households. And the households which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the adversity shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. The story behind this account is, Israel has come across the Jordan River and won a great victory. What was their first victory on the other side? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Jericho. Thank you. Jericho. And they had marched around it, and they did exactly as God said, and they marched around seven times the last day, one time every other day during the week. They gave a loud shout, and the walls fell down. And they went in, and they spoiled the city, but they did not take anything from the city. They offered it as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Lord said, don't take anything. Well... There's always somebody, isn't there? Mm -hmm. There's always somebody. And this individual looked both ways and said, well, nobody will know. I mean, why should I tell, take, throw away this gold and let it be burned up? Well, how about if I take this stuff? Stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I'll just uh, hide it underneath my tent flaps and underneath the carpet in my tent. And nobody will know. You know, it's always a bad idea to think that God doesn't see what we're doing. Well, everything seemed to be going along fine. And the person who had, who had taken the accursed thing, uh, there was a curse upon him, but didn't look, didn't look like anything bad was happening. He, he had the money. He had the, the possession. And nobody seemed to know. And everybody's still cordial to him, so... He thinks he got away with it. Well, then it's time to go against the city of Ai. And uh, Joshua says, well, we don't need everybody to go up. I mean, we conquered a much bigger city here at Jericho with the Lord's help. We're just going to send a few thousand guys up, and they'll wipe out the, that Ai group without a problem, because the Lord is on our side. <clears throat> well, they went up to Ai, and they ran before the people of that city, and were slaughtered and killed, and they turned their backs on their enemies and just flat out ran in full retreat. They were chased all the way back to their camp. And Joshua said, what's this about? You gave us a victory at Jericho, and now we go to a little, little podunk little town of Ai, and we get walled. And the Lord said, somebody did the accursed thing, took it for themselves. I won the victory. The spoils belong to me. Right? Which one of those Israelis tore down that wall? None of them. God did the work. All they did was shout and stand in place. And so the Lord said, lest you think that you won the victory, I want you to take all the spoils and make it as an offering. And it's supposed to click. We didn't do this. God did this. And so in their future exploits, they'd realize it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit, you're going to get the victory. So He said, I want you to have the people pass by, tribe by tribe, in front of you, Joshua. And I'll show you who it is. 
He said, well, why didn't he just point it out? Because we serve a God of great mercy. Anywhere along this process, the person could have come forward, repented, and been forgiven. But he thought nobody was going to find out his sin. And they went through every single tribe. And God revealed to Joshua, not that tribe, not that tribe. That's the tribe. Okay. And then every family representative in the, in the thing. Another chance to come clean. Another opportunity to repent, receive forgiveness, and fall on the mercy of God. And have you, haven't you noticed God is a merciful God? Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't do it. Then they went through every tribe and every family and the, every household and the guy still wouldn't repent. And so judgment fell on him. And so it's an act of God's mercy. And God, uh, in this occasion on the election, not the election, but the coronation of the king, he was reconfirming to Samuel what he'd already told him. How many of you are thankful when the Lord confirms something? Amen that he already told you. Mm -hmm. It's just a double blessing. Mm -hmm. When the Lord lets you know something, and then it's confirmed. And it, it helps our faith. Amen? Mm -hmm. At least it does mine. It helps my faith. When it's confirmed, when it's, when it's uh, made real. It's something that you knew, and then God confirms it again. And so, God had already selected, and the king had already been anointed, but he was reconfirming it to the people. And the people had a sense after they all passed through, it's not me, it's not him, not it's Saul. The anointing was upon Saul, son of Kish, to be the to be the king. So they passed all through, and Saul wasn't even there. But everyone knew who the next king, the first king, was to be. It was confirmed in their spirit. Saul wasn't there. Where is Saul hanging out? In the baggage. He's in the baggage department. He's in the baggage department where people just dumped off their stuff and went over to the gathering. Now, equipment sounds so much better, doesn't it? It sounds so much more sophisticated. But I love the King James. He was hiding among the stuff. Hidden among the stuff. The baggage. Now why in the world was Saul, do you think, it doesn't specifically tell us, but from what we've learned already about Saul, why is he hiding among the stuff? He doesn't feel worthy. He doesn't feel he's up to the task. Remember what he told Samuel when Samuel said, you're the one the Lord's chosen. He said, you talking to me. You, I, you talking to me. I'm in the smallest tribe. The smallest family in the tribe. I'm the only son of Kish. We're the smallest of the smallest of the smallest. All those Jews have big families, not my daddy. I'm the only one. He says, it's not your size or your position. It's when the Lord anointed He called you. And He told me you were coming before you got here. So He was, according to Saul's own testimony, He did not feel either worthy or capable of doing what God had called Him to do. Would you talk to me about that? Not feeling worthy or capable. What does that tell us? What does that say to you? Anything? Everybody just kind of drowned out by the weather? Well, he was humble to, to a fall. He was humble. He, he knew he was not up for it. A 
uh, to the test. Humility. Uh, sometimes, you know, we can say, well, no, 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 no. no. Uh, false humility is not what we're talking about here. He didn't feel worthy of being the king. He didn't think that he was up to the task. And that's a good thing. When we think we're up to the task that God has called us to, we tend to not rely on God. It's a, it's a sad thing, but when we think we can handle it, and we try to handle it, we usually mess up. Anyway. I'm just speaking from personal experience. But when we're dependent upon the Lord, and we've sought Him out, and we realize, ah, in my strength I can't do this. As we were talking Sunday, I've got no strength for this journey. But God can see us through. A dependence upon, upon Him. And uh, anything else you see about Saul hiding out among the stuff or the baggage or the equipment? Anything else? Yeah. Pastor, what, I, what I'm thinking about is, is Saul's uh, feeling about himself, about not being worthy. I think so much that I can relate to as a young Christian. Uh, when I was asked to do things within the church, within mm -hmm. the Christian church, I didn't feel worthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can kind of identify with them in yeah. that regard. Uh, when you're asked to do a great task and lead the people, I think a lot of us probably feel unworthy. Right. It's, it's a. It's a. It's a. A positive and a negative. We don't want to miss out on what God has for us. But if I think yeah, I can handle this, you probably got the wrong attitude. You're going to rely upon your own strength. Yeah. Wouldn't you have been scared? I think I would. I've been scared. Yeah. Scared of failure. He's the first. He's the first king. Mm, yeah. You don't want to you let know. God down. Good point. Huh? Good point. You don't want to let God down. No, don't want to let God down. And. Uh, it's not really a nation, it's a grouping of tribes that, that don't sometimes get along well with each other, don't play nice together. Uh, boy, I don't know if I'm up to this or not. I, I remember on a couple occasions uh, when I was, was leaving a thriving church in Massillon, God had called us to pioneer a church in Reynoldsburg. And I had a thriving church. We just you know, we're reaching the city and it was it was great. I had a great staff, great facility, and we had an impact in the community, but the Lord troubled my spirit that he wanted me to, to go to Reynoldsburg and start a church. And I remember I was you know, I'd started a church before, but my goodness, I was scared spitless. I, I was I was scared. And what I do is on Saturday mornings, I would send Linda and the kids over to be with her mom on the other side of town. And I spent the whole morning praying because, oh, I'm, ooh, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm up for this or not. But it was a good thing. Because if I thought I could handle it, then we'd really be in trouble. It was, a, it was one of those things of dependence and leaning upon the Lord to help us. When we get an arrogant attitude that we can handle it, and you'll find that ultimately was Saul's downfall. When he stopped realizing it's God, not me. When it went to his head, he lost everything. But uh, anything else about why he was hiding out among the stuff and the baggage? Yeah. I just think we have to keep in mind that whatever the Lord has called us to do, our dependence upon Him will never end so long as we draw breath. Right. It's got to be a continuing. It's not just to start out. Uh, when you get on an air, on a on a jetliner and you you're starting to, they're warming the engines up. You know that feeling. They're getting those engines ready and you 
you, you get out on the, the, the runway for takeoff, and then at a certain signal, you they power it up, and you hear the noise, and there's rattles and everything going on, and it goes up in the air. Some people relax. Other people don't. Because I hope those engines keep working all the way to where we arrive. Amen? Amen. Just because you got a good start doesn't mean you're going to have a wonderful finish if the engines conk out. Uh, there's no coasting downhill, well, kind of, with the plane. But, you know, you, you've got to have, have them working the whole trip. And have you noticed, I don't know if anybody else studies these kind of things, but it always gets to me. What happens when, you, when you're playing your big jet lands? The sound of the engines or anything. What, anything? Have you noticed anything that happens? Yeah. Well, yeah, everybody cheers, you know, especially you get to Israel. People are cheering. We made it. Uh, we're back in our homeland. Have any of you ever noticed this? That when it lands, the engines speed up and they have a plate that goes up in front of the jet engines and so it's pushing you back to try and stop you. A little set of disc brakes is not going to stop a 600 mile per hour, uh, you know, event. And uh, so they rev the engines up even at the end. Uh, I don't want to try and coast to the end. I want the Holy Ghost to rev the engines up. Don't just say, well, I'm just going to make it by. I don't want to just make it by. I don't want to get in by the skin of my teeth. I want to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We need to keep on keeping on. Uh, so Saul had all of these feelings, I believe, running through him. But why hide out among the stuff? Any thoughts on that? Hiding out among the baggage or the stuff. Carissa said he was looking for some underwear. Looking for some Well, you never know. Well, I, I have had an occasion like that when first night in Israel, first night in, in uh, uh, Tiberias, get a knock on the door. I look out and one of the folks from the church are there and, and I, Pastor, we've got a problem. I said, oh, what is it? Maybe you need a, an adapter for your electric or something. It's a snow. And my husband forgot to pack any underwear. That's why we're not checklist. And, and it just so happens. It's your size. Yeah. And, and, uh, and Linda had bought an extra whole pack of brand new underwear. So I'll just throw it in just in case it's me. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> but the guy, the guy, all through the rest of the trip, every day he'd come up, thanks again, Pastor, thanks again. <laughs> I says, no, thank you that you're changing every day. I appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. But maybe he was looking for something. That's true. That's a possibility. Uh, what are some other possibilities? Why is hiding out among the luggage, the stuff? Maybe they'll give up on him and find somebody else. Yeah. He wants to be out of sight, out of mind. Everybody else is supposed to be parading it in front of the prophet, right? That's all. He's already heard what he doesn't want to hear. He says, I'm going to wait until that parade dies down before I come out. And he's hiding among the stuff. Hoping that if he's out of sight, even God can't find him. 
And there, there, after the Spirit of the Lord bore witness that it was Saul, son of Kish, everybody said, well, where is he? I haven't seen him. You seen Saul? No, I haven't seen him. He was here before. I haven't seen him. And so they asked the Lord. And the Lord said, right over there. He's hiding out in the baggage. He's hiding out in the stuff. Now picture this. Think about this for a moment. A person is being crowned the king of Israel. To lead them in battle against the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Amorites and the Hittites and everybody other rights. And where's he? He's hiding now. Because he doesn't want the job. Yeah. We know he was the youngest, right? Yeah. Where, where would you put him at age, do you think? Would that have had anything to do with it? That he was just, I wouldn't say immature, but, you know, he's so young, he's worried about all these huge responsibilities as king, and he's, what, 12 years old or 14 years old? Or it, it, it suggests that he was not 12, that he was late teens, early adulthood because of the job that his father tasked him with. Okay. He traveled over a hundred miles from home mm -hmm. looking for lost donkeys. Gotcha. So the immensity of that would lead us to believe it we're not told his age. But in this in this situation he was also, what else do we know about him that would indicate that he was uh, not a little kid? His height. Yeah. He's head and shoulders taller than everybody else in the kingdom. Somebody to look up to. And uh, so you really have to hide out if you're taller than everybody. <laughs> He's hunkered down behind, the, behind the, somebody's suitcase. And I know. Uh, we don't know for certain, Jamie. It doesn't tell us, but it would lead us to believe because of his task that was assigned by his father and his physical attributes, he's bigger than anybody in the house. Uh, seems, seems that perhaps he was an older, you know, young, late teen, early 20s, whatever, maybe even up to 30. I don't know. He was still in his father's house. He wasn't married and gone. So. so Saul knew that he had already been chosen. He didn't want to go to the parade. <laughs> he didn't want to do anything else. He's hiding out while everybody else is trying to figure out who the next king will be. And he was hiding over among the baggage. Why do you think he was hiding out there? Any ideas? Huh? Yeah. It's a good hiding spot. And if you've got all the tribes of Israel showing up, you're going to have some stuff that you can hide behind. And their attention was not on their stuff. It was on the Lord and the prophet. Their attention was shifted away from that. They weren't worried about that. They weren't going down to baggage check and checking on their, their luggage, going around the turnstile again and again and again. It was just forgotten about. The, uh, so it was kind of out of sight, out of mind, out of reach. And he was hiding out there. <clears throat> Yeah, when Elijah went and hid out in the cave and, and everything like that. Well, when Jezebel decided that she... Oh, yeah, when she went after him, no. uh, he, he took off. No. He took off running. He was overwhelmed. God had walked with him in every step before that, but one threat from old Jesse, and he's hitting the, hitting the pavement. Gideon also. Gideon the same way. Hiding out that mighty man of valor. Hiding out so that the Midianites don't steal his grain. Thou mighty man of valor. <laughs> you know, 
So it's a common thread that we find in the, in the Bible that if you think you're worthy, you're probably not. But if you have hesitancy, you remember prophet Isaiah? He's been ushered into the presence of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. And he sees, he sees the glory of the Lord. His glory of the angelic beings. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole place is filled with the smoke of His glory and His presence. And the, the place is shaken. And he says, uh-oh. I, I, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king. He didn't feel worthy until the seraphim came and touched his lips with the coal and said, you've been cleansed. And then he said, here am I. Send me. So, the attitude has a lot to do with it. As I was reading this, another thing came to mind how that sometimes people hide out among other stuff rather than serve the Lord, as he's called it. Uh, they've allowed stuff to cloud their ability or their willingness to serve the Lord. Let me give you an illustration. I had a... Uh, a guy in one of my churches and he was in my estimation one of the finest Bible teachers I've ever had the privilege to sit on and uh, he was just excellent I remember we, we went to church there Linda went to Sunday school and said okay this guy's good well prepared prayed over his back just excellent he wasn't reading the lesson to you. He was, he was making it come alive. And I met with him at different times. We'd have revival services. He'd be at the altar. He'd, I'd meet with him. He says, well, when I was younger, God called me to preach. And I told him, first of all, I want to provide for my family. Have that, that everything taken care of. And then... <laughs> Then, then I will. And we were working with him. Maybe he was going to get into the ministry and, and work on it. He said, well, he was doing a good job, yeah. But he was still hiding among the stuff. It wasn't what God called him for. And then he said, well, I, I've determined that as soon as my kids all graduate from high school, then I'll... He'd already been to Bible college and had a lot of training under his belt. But he said, I'll, as soon as they're out of the house and it's just me and my wife, then, then I'll, I'll uh, honor that call that God put on my life years ago. Never happened. He was very successful in business. Uh, possessions and all kinds of things. By all estimations, thoroughly successful. But to this day, he's still hiding out among the stuff. And not, you say, well, you, you know, he's doing a good job at what he's doing. Well, that's true. But I believe that kind of ability and anointing, God could sure use it today. We've got a lot of, uh, let me get, I don't want to get mean here, but we've got some clowns out there that are called pastors that are not pastoring the flock. That are just in it for show. Yeah. I think every day of your life you have to choose to allow God to be God. Mm -hmm. It's a daily decision, but every day it gets easier and easier to say yes to God. It uh, doesn't mean that you're not going to have bigger challenges, but that was when I think of this this thing, Someone with a calling on his life, but he was hiding among the stuff. I gotta have the job, I gotta have this money, I gotta have that money, that possession, whatever. When the kids are out and gone, well the kids are out and gone. And, and the one the one kid is a pastor himself. 
but it, it's always one of those <clears throat> what could have been what could have been can you think of any other people in the Bible who God had big plans for but they decided to hide out among stuff that held them back We don't know his name, but the rich young ruler would be one. He knew his Bible, didn't he? Knew his Bible. And he came to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to him. He came to Jesus with the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, do this, this, and this. And he said, check, 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 check. Jesus said, well, there's one, one more thing. You got some stuff that's holding you back from following me. Uh, we're on the road. No room for stuff. We're going from place to place, and the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. If you want to follow me, lose the stuff. And what did the rich, young ruler decide to do? He went back with the stuff. It's a... I've often thought about putting together a drama of the rich, young ruler, but I, as I start writing it, it just breaks my heart. There's no victory there. Maybe there was victory later on, but you see his shoulders just sloop down. And he walked away and hid out among the stuff. He had great possessions, but the stuff had him. Think of any other illustrations of people that <coughs> stuff got in the way of them following the Lord. Did you say that Samson? Samson, he, uh, from before he was born, there was a covenant, and he latched onto that Nazarite vow, and he was anointed by God with great strength. But it was not because of him. It's because of the covenant with God. And he got so involved in what he wanted that he let the stuff cloud his vision of what he was to be about. He was instructed to never reveal the source of his strength. But the stuff of a relationship. Jamie had his hand up first and then Mike. Wasn't there a bad trap with the Apostle Paul? Demas. Demas. Well, uh, yeah. Demas. Is that who you were, you were doing? Demas, Paul says... We have references of Demas being on the front ministry team with the Apostle Paul. Before Paul arrives in the city, his advance team goes in and sets everything up. And Demas is regarded as a co-laborer with Paul. I mean, that's he's not a flunky. He's a co-laborer, Paul says. But then when Paul is in jail in Rome. He writes to Timothy and said, Demas has forsaken me. And he's gone to Thessalonica, the big city, because he has the lust of other things. He's seeking those things. Yeah. Well, Ananias is higher up. Yeah. They let stuff get in their way of being what God wanted them to be. They allowed their stuff to cloud their vision and view. They wanted the, the praise of men. Well, we gave everything to the, to the church. We've laid it all down. Well, not really. But they let their stuff. Peter said it best. He said, while you had it, it was yours. Nobody told you to give it. So why did you decide to lie to the Holy Spirit 
They wanted a, a little nest egg to keep back. Stuff got in their way of serving the Lord. It was a costly mistake, was it not? Yeah. A costly mistake. These are all good. Can you think of some others? Yeah. Judas. Judas, he let stuff get in the way, did he not? Jesus rebuked him in Bethany when he said, well, they should have sold that, that fragrance for money given to the poor. And Scripture says he didn't mean, he didn't care about the poor. He was keeper for the money. And Jesus rebuked him. And the next verse says, and he went out and sought to betray him. What will you give me to rat out Jesus? They, he gave them, gave them the price that was prophetic. Of the 30 pieces of silver. And he had it in hand. Stuff got in the way of following Jesus. Excellent. Any any others? Yeah. Elisha's servant. Oh, my yeah. Elisha's servant. Remember the story? Elisha's in the house. The commander of the Syrian troops has come down. And he has leprosy. And the little maiden has said, you know, you ought to go down and see the man of God. He can heal you. God can heal you. And he shows up with all of his troops and horses and all kinds of give, cool gifts to give to the prophet. The prophet doesn't even come out. He says, oh, go dip in the Jordan seven times. You'll be just fine. Take seven dips and call me in the morning. And uh, he's incensed and his advice is, hey, if he asked you to do a big thing, you'd have done it, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So we come all this way, you know. What, what can it hurt? And he dips down in the water and he comes up and he's healed of his leprosy. And he, he, he says, hey, I've got all this cool stuff from the king to give you. And the prophet says, no, no thanks. The things of God cannot be bought. He, he, Naaman goes off. And so the servant looks around and Elisha goes back in to take a nap or whatever and he takes off after. <laughs> and he says, excuse me, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. The prophet uh, thought of, uh, of a good charity that we could take and give that to. There's some prophets just been hiding out, not doing well, and, and if you could just give me some of the stuff, I'll take it back to him. And he took it and he hid it. When he came back, the prophet said, hey, what you been, where you been? Oh, I've been here and there. Just been around. Just chilling. And he said, I know where you've been. And right now, the leprosy that the Lord took off of Naaman is on you. And instantaneously, he was eaten up with a leprous plague. Stuff got in the way, didn't it? Stuff got in the way. When I was uh, interviewing potential candidates for ministry for credentials. One of the questions deals with finances. And uh, I would always ask them, you know, what kind of debt do you have? And it's getting more and more and more and more where huge debt is incurred in getting an education. And uh, I said, you, you know, what's your debt level and what where could you go? And he says, well, you know, I can't go to some small place. I've got to be able to make the payments on this, and, and I've got this, and I've got that, and I've got to do this and do that. And, and uh, so they had limited their ability to serve wherever God called them. They were dictating to God where they could go because of their stuff. It hindered ministry. Anybody else? Any other aspects of when stuff got in the way of 
somebody serving and following Jesus. Yeah. Solomon. 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 Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Did the stuff get in the way? As as the one little child said, he had a thousand porcupines. <laughs> <laughs> but it might as well have been porcupines. But he had all this wealth and everything, but his stuff got the best of him. He married strange wives to make uh, treaties with other places, and ultimately it took over. And he couldn't be the kind of king that he was supposed to be. His stuff got in the way. And just like Saul, sometimes if we're not careful, we can hide out among the stuff and allow them to be our excuse for not serving God as we're supposed to. Uh, whether it's, you know, well, I've got to work with that person. I can't witness to them and, and have them all upset with me. Okay. God told you that. I didn't tell you to witness to him. God did. And you know it. Well, I don't want to get pushy. I don't want to. Uh, we can allow stuff to get in our way. What can we learn about the stuff of life? The baggage that we carry. What, what can lessons we can learn here from hiding out among the stuff to avoid what God's called us to do and be? Yeah. Hold you back from being what you can be for the Lord. It'll hold you back. It's a stumbling block. A stumbling block. That word is used in the scriptures to trip you up. I don't know about you. I have trouble. I trip over my own feet sometimes. I don't need anybody to throw a stumbling block. I stumble on my own. Fumble, bumble, stumble. But when we allow stuff to rise up so big that we can't get around it and serve God, I have too many illustrations of good men who have allowed stuff to keep them from following God. Yes? I think you also miss out on contentment and peace of mind. Yeah. And you're always, you can never get enough stuff. Yeah. yeah it, you, you miss out on the peace. Uh, the, the Lord provides, but some people got to have it tangibly there, and they're not at peace. Uh, they're, they're always striving for the next dollar bill or the next million. doesn't matter. And I've known people that are extremely wealthy, but they, they weren't at peace with it. And I've known people that were dirt poor, were just happy as a lark, doing whatever God would call them to do. When we go up to Camp Syker, I always remember one of the stalwarts of that camp when I was growing up, everybody looked up to Melvin Bowers. Melvin Bowers was about 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> Tall and thin. And he was the caretaker of the facility. He could outwork anybody. I know for a fact, one year at, during the summer break from college, Tom and I, my brother Tom and I, signed on to help them take camp down. This is back in the days when they had tents. And we were taking these officers' tents down and storing all the furniture and everything. And he, we started joking about Melvin Bowers. He doesn't get a glass of water. He drinks a quart of oil. He's just a machine. They got, I mean, we're, we're just college-age guys, and, and he's just, we're praying to be able to go to bed at night. He says, well, we've got a couple more things we got to do. we got to clean up the tabernacle and stack those pews up in the air. And, huh? <laughs> you know. And uh, but Melvin, he didn't make a lot being the custodian of the, of the camp. He basically was probably fairly poor, but he was very handy with his hands and doing work. And one year, we were going through camp and there was a missions budget that we were trying to reach. And it was just out of sight. And coming down to the end of camp, 
Melvin was the was on the board, and he got up and made a, an appeal. He says we we need to come up with at least ten thousand dollars tonight, or else our missionaries are not going to be supported fully. It didn't come in. It didn't come in. Melvin Bowers went out and mortgaged his house. He seemed taller after that to me. He seemed a lot taller. We don't have to allow the stuff to get in the way. Well, he was hiding out. He was trying to get around there so that people wouldn't look for him there. But the Lord knew where he was, and the Lord knows where every one of us is. Amen? Amen. So, so they ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people, verse 23, from his shoulders upward. And uh, the King James says, I think, head and shoulders above. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? That there is no one like him. It wasn't an election. God had already chosen. He was just confirming it to the people of Israel. And all the people shouted, well, not all of them. Long live the king. <laughs> and Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. They didn't have a palace or anything. They, and valiant men went with him whose hearts God had touched. You remember last time, God touched him by the Spirit and gave him a new heart. And now, in his leadership position, he had people following him that God touched their heart. But some rebels said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, no presents for you, but he held his peace. This comes into play a little bit later. I got, I got to risk it. I don't have all that much time. But this part of the story is so unique and cool. Look there at 11, uh, verse 1. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up and encamped against Jabez, Jabez Gilead. And all the men of Jabez said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. And Nahash, the Ammonite, answered them, On this condition... I will make a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. The elders of Jabez said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. Ooh, man! Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, wants, he's willing to have a treaty with this group of Jews from Jabez Gilead. But what's his condition? Out of the eye. Their right eye is going to be plucked out. Now, anybody have an idea why the right eye? How many of you here tonight are left-handed? One. That's, that's pretty well the way it works. A very low percentage. And left-handed people tend to be left-eye dominant. And right-handed people tend to be right-eye dominant. It's not me. I, I did some research on it. But, uh, and in those days, how did they do battle back in those days? Right hand sword, or spear, or arrow. And the sighting eye, to give you depth perception and everything else, for the most part, 
Because the Bible says there weren't that many left-handed because when they find a left-handed guy, they make mention. He was left-handed. They, they make mention of it. Right. It's so rare in Israel. It's a rare thing. And uh, that's the reason today when they're looking at pictures, they're trying to find a left-hander because we, we can't hit him. You know. But uh, the so the king was hedging his bet. I'll make a covenant with you, but I'm going to take away your men's ability to fight back. You're not going to be able to sight the arrow as you should. You're, it's, it, it's going to be, uh, you're not going to be able to, to wield the sword like that. Right? Pick up a sword. Your right hand and pick up a sword. How are you going to fight with the guy? You're going to sight off your dominant eye. So he was hedging his bed. If they submitted to this, if no one was coming to save them, no cavalry coming over the hillside to rescue them, their eyes were their right eye was going to be plucked out, and they couldn't fight back. But Saul got word of it. And he sent word around to all the tribes. He's just been king a brief while. And the sequence of it seems to suggest he hasn't been in that position long. He's back in his hometown still. He sent word around our brothers over at Jabez Gilead need our help. And the troops rallied. Yeah, he made a threat. He said, if you, if you don't uh, come out and fight with us, we're going to take every one of your oxen and burn it, have it for lunch. <laughs> and you're not even going to be invited to the barbecue. So, yeah, yeah, he put a little threat out there. But this is his first week in the palace, so to speak. First week behind the kingship. And they go over and they save the men and the people of Jabez, Jabez, Gilead. But that's not the end of the story. I'm not going to take time to read it. Write this down in your notes. 1 Samuel chapter 31. We're in 1 Samuel 11, right? 1 Samuel 31. 11 through 13. Don't look it up right now. I'm just going to tell you the story. This is after all of Saul, King Saul's reign. After Saul has even fallen out of sorts with God. The Philistines are on the attack and ultimately King Saul is killed. They took his body. He sliced his head off. Took his body and the body of his sons and nailed them to the door, the gate of the city of Beit Shan. And 1 Samuel 31, 11 through 13 tells us this. When they heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, the men of Jabez, Gilead, went in, stole in, pulled down the dead lifeless corpses of the one who had saved them many, many years before, took them out, and gave them a proper burial. They didn't forget who saved them. They didn't forget what Saul had done. And we need to we need to continue to remember the blessings of the Lord and not forget them. There's a tendency as time passes to forget how good God has been to us. 
It's good on occasion to look back and remember the times of His blessing. The salvation, the healings, the times He's intervened, the times that He's made a way where there was no way. These men of Jabesh Gilead remembered who saved them and they took action on it. What a touching story. But you would remember with me tonight who saved you. What the Lord has done. What, what His mercy has been in your direction. His graciousness. We've not been worthy of it. But He's been there for us. Think of all the times you've let it down. Maybe it's just me. Maybe you have to. But he's been faithful to welcome us home. Dust us off. Point out where we messed up. And still want to be with us. And just like in the story of Saul, we need to remember the blessings that we we've had from the Lord. And remember those people like uh, I was I was blessed by remembering Melvin Bowers in that story again. <laughs> Getting ready to go to Camp Syker and, and try to see young lives changed <clears throat> at the same altars where I got my call to preach. And see life touched and changed. We've already seen some transformations at the altars at Camp Syker right here in our own church. And uh, don't forget. Don't forget who saved you. Don't forget those who have been blessings to you in times past. God's remembering God's blessing. One last thing before we close up shop tonight. You remember those rebels? The ones that didn't have any good thing to say about Saul when he was crowned king? He ain't my king. I ain't going to follow him. And they rebelled. Well, when they came back from beating up on Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, some of the followers of King Saul said, Hey, those guys, we ought to take them up and string them up. Take them out, string them up. We ought to kill them. While we're in a killing mood here, we got rid of the Ammonites. Let's get rid of the rebels. And they went to the same and said, how about we take care of those boys that weren't on board with the new king? So he looked over to Saul and Saul said, Saul didn't let that kind of stuff get in his way. The servant of the Lord. He started off as a good king. He could have sought revenge, but he extended mercy. How many of you have ever been in a position where you could have sought revenge? But the Lord prompted you to extend mercy. We're going to stop from there tonight. prayer request this evening. I just went down this afternoon to uh, see Terry and Rhonda and all of the, the family that's there. For those of you not aware, Rhonda took on the challenge of bringing her mother and her mother-in-law both to live in that house with her. They did major renovations to make it possible and now Terry broke his heel in multiple places. And she's waiting on all of them. <laughs> so, uh, you pray for Rhonda. <laughs> but he's doing well. He won't be back at church quite yet. Uh, he still has to keep his foot elevated at all times. And, and uh, when they get the stitches out, then he thinks he might be able to <clears throat> reconnoiter the uh, getting here and everything. It's tough when your foot's hanging up like that to drive any place. He's not allowed to drive for eight weeks. 
But it's just as hard to find some place to sit yeah. in a car when your leg's sticking out like that. <laughs> so you pray for Terry and the whole family. Other prayer requests tonight? Yes. Oh, for my husband, um, I mentioned to you that he had his joints bothering him, had arthritis, and he's one of his disabilities, and he has a hand, elbows, and he's uncomfortable today. This weather will, if you didn't know you had some before, <laughs> you know you've got it today. Got a little hitch in our get alongs this weather. We'll be praying for Bill tonight. Praying for our unsaved loved ones. Praying for situations that God knows about that need God's intervention. I just know of several. Need an intervention from heaven to take care of. Need to pray for our, our country pray for our world. Our world needs Jesus. Good news, the two crates that were being shipped to Madagascar were picked up yesterday. And uh, me and the guys was here. They sent him without a power jack. Oh, so he and I were oh, working out with the, with the crates. And uh, Kind of like when you were working out with that air conditioner one time. Oh. I, I remembered that while I'm pushing oh. on this crate. <laughs> oh no, don't want to do that. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, so they're on their way. I sent a post to uh, Jay and Carrie, our missionaries to Madagascar, and let them know that I, I opened the crates up and put some Canadian geese in there. <laughs> we were always rasping. They would walk and the geese would chase them. And Jay had a, a little taser he was trying to get the geese with. They didn't like him at all. So, uh, but they, they've got their visa and they're getting ready to head back to Madagascar. So continue to pray for them. Yes? What was the board on visa anyway? Do you know? It was uh, political. They had to go a different route. Um, sometimes, previously, when they were in France at school, language school, they would go straight through that embassy and go to Israel, but there's people get a little itsy here and there. They had to come back and go through this, our State Department to make it happen. So People like to play around. Well, let's go to prayer. Can I have a few people lead us out in a word of prayer tonight? And could we, before we even pray, just individually, not a long <coughs> verse about it, but lift up the name of, of some that you're remembering tonight have been a blessing to you, encouragement to you. Just praise God for them. Say, well, they're already in heaven. Well, I think, I think heaven will let them listen in. I just have a hunch. And uh, so let's spend some time remembering who saved you and remembering who's blessed you and touched your lives. <clears throat> start out, my good friend Paul Wright, who a year and a half ago went home to be with the Lord. I miss my buddy. He blessed me in so many ways. Praise God for him. Praise God to my uh, Uncle Leslie and Aunt Nancy, the first one that ever took us to church and Bible study. Got us, got us started. Praise God. Baptized. And I also looked up the middle thing they are. Ruth and Arlie, they were a great, great blessing in our lives, in my life, as far as living up to what they said they were. Thanks, yeah. they, they encouraged us. And I just thank the Lord so much for bringing them in our lives. Praise God. Praise God for my 
out in prayer over these matters. Chili Alakal Mosunter Kurial Matari Fasiata Chala Kosita Mokorial Mosunter Kalyar Hata Karmosolio Kara Chasata Kalyar Mosunter Kurial Masar Kalyar Koriko Siata Maka